Good morning and welcome to the 12th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2017. Can I at the start ask everybody to switch off their electronic devices um, or at least switch them to silence so they don't um, interfere with the proceedings of the committee. Um, item one on the agenda is to uh, agree to take items four and five in private. Is that agreed? Thank you very much. Item two is the committee will now take further oral evidence on the Auditor General's 2015-16 Audit of the Scottish Police Authority. Um, we are, of course, focusing on the issues of governance and transparency. And I welcome to the committee this morning um, Derek Penman, Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland, Brian Barber and Moy Ali, former board members of the SPA, David Hume, George Graham and Ian White, current board members of the SPA. Now, a number of witnesses are going to make brief opening statements. Let me let me emphasise the brief. I will give you a 30 second warning before we get to three minutes and then I will cut you off um, because I want to preserve the time available to the committee to ask questions. So if you can um, stick to that, that would be um, very, very helpful indeed. So on that basis, can I invite Derek Penman to go first and provide us with a statement to the committee. Thank you, Convener. Firstly, can I thank the committee for its invitation to give evidence at this morning's session and for the opportunity to support the committee's scrutiny of the Scottish Police Authority in light of the Section 22 report submitted by the Auditor General. Um, as the committee is already aware, um, I have committed to a statutory inspection of the Scottish Police Authority as part of my scrutiny plan for 2017 and 18. Uh, on the 9th of December, I wrote to the Chair of the SPA advising him of this inspection and confirming that it uh, would provide an opportunity to review the Authority's new governance arrangements as well as provide a wider review of the Authority, uh, the work of its officers and the services it provides. Uh, I had initially planned to conduct this inspection over the next eight months, effectively building uh, um, evidence to support uh, an assessment of the overall state effectiveness and efficiency of the SBA and had intended publishing the report around January in 2018. However, following the evidence given by the SPA at this committee and the Justice Subcommittee in Policing, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice has requested that I bring forward an element of my inspection. This relates to issues around openness and transparency in the way that the SPA conducts its business, specifically in terms of the Authority's decision to hold committee meetings in private and restrict the publication of meeting papers. Uh, I'm also aware that this committee has heard evidence from the SPA over its handling of the resignation of board member Moy Ali, and I'm aware that members have raised questions, particularly in compliance with on board uh, a guide for members and statutory boards. Um, I had been made aware of the circumstances surrounding Moy Ali's resignation in de December 2016 um, and have already made a public commitment to consider any relevant concerns um, that were raised from that during my planned inspection. However, as a result of the request from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice and in response to the recent parliamentary scrutiny by this committee, I have agreed to bring forward a review of openness and transparency in the way that SB conducts its business. Uh, a specific report will be prepared in respect of this review, highlighting our findings and any recommendations or other areas for improvement that may be identified. I wouldn't order, ordinarily preempt my review um, or, 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 or my recommendations, but it would probably be fair to say and perhaps helpful for the committee that it would be unlikely um, that I won't be making a recommendation to the chair of the police authority that the board meeting and the committee meetings should revert to being held in public and that papers should be um, circulated in advance of the meeting um, from there. So I thought it might be helpful um, for the committee to understand that that's the likely out outcome for the work that we have been doing so far and may indeed be helpful for the chair to consider that position uh, in advance of a report being published. Um, the review that we're doing just now is narrow, um, but it will complement our scheduled and more comprehensive statutory inspection of the authority during 2017-18, and that will include um, a wider assessment specifically of leadership and governance within the authority. I've drawn up a terms of reference for the review, um, but I have decided not to publish them until after this morning's committee meeting. Um, I think that provides an opportunity to include any relevant issues or concerns raised by members in the morning session, which would benefit from further examination by um, HMICS. Um, I can give more detail around the approach that we're taking, but I'm conscious you're, you have time constraints. Um, but it would be my intention to publish our terms of reference later today or tomorrow. 
Thank you very much, Mr Penman. Your comments are very welcome indeed. Um, could I invite Brian Barber to give a statement now? Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for inviting me to give evidence today. I left the SPA 18 months ago and until Moy Ali's resignation had made no public comment about the SPA. Policing is enormously important and I was privileged to be part of it. And I think police officers and staff do an amazing job in very difficult circumstances and often a great danger to themselves. But policing costs over £1 billion a year and it needs and deserves strong oversight. It saddens me that the SPA has become the story because of what seems a desire to keep things private. Nobody and nothing appears able to cause ripples, but this approach just causes bigger problems later. And the SPA has been the story for months, uh, but despite this, the board has remained silent, as it often is, passive and only taking action or speaking up when forced, rather than leading the debate. Why has the board remained silent, publicly silent on the treatment of Moy Ali, on the HMICS letter, on criticism from this committee, negative comment in Parliament and negative comment from the media? And Parliament created the SPA uh, and when it passed the Police and Fire Reform Act and it authorised the SPA to hold the Chief Constable to account for the performance of policing. Perhaps Parliament should now appoint SPA members and in turn the SPA should be accountable to Parliament. Whatever the outcome, the SPA should operate in a transparent manner, consistent with good governance, as mandated in Section 2 of the Act. Then it can go back to supporting police in the job they do and holding the Chief Constable to account for the way Scotland is policed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Barber. Um, could I now invite George Graham to give us a statement, please? Good morning, convener. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Many thanks for the opportunity to say a few words this morning. I did get your warning. I will be as brief as possible, so I've rewritten my hour and a half that I had prepared. Convener, transparency and openness is undoubtedly a focus of today, and I want to give you all a sense of why we as SPA board members took the decisions we did around public and private business. Can I just say that as a board, we know it is, and we are committed to every key policing issue and every key policing decision being addressed in public at the appropriate point. So I think my own view is that it is wrong to see this as the Scottish Police Authority choosing which issues to have in public and which issues to have in private. It's more complex than that. It is a question of when and not if an issue enters the public domain. But it's not just the issue, it's the debate around it and when that enters the public domain. The aim of the governance changes was to focus committee attention on issues that matter, rather than getting bogged down in extraneous and often unnecessary detail at open board meetings. In our committees, a refocus on early discussion and engagement was to add more value to the full board's public subsequent public scrutiny and public decision making. Taking this committee business in private was aimed at getting early visibility for the Scottish Police Authority on the challenges and complexity of emerging policing issues so that all options could be explored and tested. We knew in taking that decision that different opinions existed and that the decision would indeed have its critics. And we took the decision with the awareness of the range of views of other stakeholders, including Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Constabulary. All our members acknowledged and debated that there were both potential benefits and challenges in adopting the revised approach. But we took the view that there is a balance to be struck in terms of transparency and effective governance. This is not, in our view, a black and white issue, but it's one of judgment and balance. Central to our decision was agreement on the need for ongoing review of the revised approach. We made that decision in December to review the approach in order to weigh the benefits against any drawbacks, and we committed to do that within six months. But a good board also needs to be responsive and accept that the public and civic voice has strengthened on this particular issue. I want to reassure you today that we are listening and we are ready to adapt our approach. Thank you, and we all look forward to contributing further today. Thank you very much, Mr Graham. Moy Ali. Good morning, and again, thank you um, for the invitation. There's much in Andrew Flanagan's evidence to this committee to take issue with, but even if his account is to be believed, it raises fundamental corporate governance issues. He knew my views on the governance framework, but told you he didn't expect me to voice them in public. 
Should a chair suppress respectful, open debate? He wrote of the value of being seen to be a united board. Where then can alternative views be discussed? Only in private, that seems to be not a good option. Andrew told you here that dissent is okay, but his letter to me talked about sharing public disagreement and how that was a resigning matter. Why should members who've accepted collective responsibility resign? That's not what the government's on board guidance says. Do SPA members now feel constrained about expressing their views in public? Surely that's not good for governance. The chair claims um, his concern was that I didn't communicate my intentions in advance. Should board members enter meetings with their minds made up and their position pre-shared? Clearly that would turn board meetings into theatre and board members into actors. My removal from committees was, in my view, straightforward punishment for speaking out. On board says members must participate in committees and equally that the chair should lead by example. I ask you what kind of an example was that? One of the key questions is, has Andrew Flanagan observed the nine principles of public life in Scotland? They include openness, honesty, leadership, respect and integrity. Was withholding Derek Penman's letter from the board an act of integrity? On board says, it's important that nothing you do or say as a board member tarnishes in any way the reputation of the board. Have Andrew Flanagan's recent actions damaged the SPA? News reports some five months after the event talk about um, hemorrhaging confidence in the beleaguered, embattled, control freak chair of a Kremlin-style crisis-hit secret society board. Now, none of those are my words. In fact, some of them are your words. The chair's style shapes board culture. Did the board request to see the HMICS letter? Did they ask why it hadn't been shared? Was there any discussion of why the chair believed I should resign? Has any member questioned Andrew over any of his evidence to this committee? On board says members should not hesitate to challenge the chair if you believe that a decision is wrong. Therefore, did they believe the decisions were right? Before members approved the governance framework, they were aware of key stakeholders' concerns. One, they discussed Audit Scotland's report, which said SPA board and, pub and committee papers were sometimes insufficiently transparent, they were only issued on the day of the meeting, and some papers taken in private could be heard in public. Audit Scotland questioned whether the SPA demonstrated high standards of corporate governance at all times, including openness and transparency in decision-making. Two, board members knew that the internal auditors had also questioned whether the proposals complied with best practice. Three, they knew that at least one local authority had raised issues and concerns. And four, colleagues knew that the Police and Fire Reform Act, the legislation that created us, said, and I state, the authority must ensure that its proceedings and those of its committees and subcommittees are held in public and must try to carry out its functions in a way which is proportionate, accountable and transparent and which is consistent with any principle of good governance which appears to it to constitute best practice. So finally, to summarise in a few bullet points, the decision on private committees and last minute publication of papers was contrary to statute and against the spirit of public service accountability. Government guidance and stakeholders' concerns were ignored by the board and the chief executive. The chair was wrong in trying to suppress information and debate. He was wrong in punishing me for taking a principled stance in public, consistent with my well-known private view. The board appears to have failed to challenge. Three months after the initial decision, the board still felt no need to revise it. And finally, the ensuing reputational damage has diminished public confidence in an important public body. Policing has to operate within the law and to earn the confidence of the public, and so too does its oversight body. Thank, Thank you very you. much to all the witnesses for at least attempting to keep within time. Um, I will now move across to my colleagues and invite Monica Lennon to start the questioning. Thank you, convener, and good morning to all our witnesses this morning. Uh, George Graham, in your opening statement towards the end, you described um, 
what are good features or are good qualities in, in a board, including being responsive and listening to criticism. Do you believe that you've been part of a good board? Um, yes, thank you for that question. Um, since Andrew Flanagan took over, I think, in November 2015, all I can describe is a changing atmosphere on a board where we have become much more engaged. There is a clearer sense of purpose around what we're trying to do. We have been addressing, I think, a particular issue around information flow and our own credibility with senior police colleagues. If we are to govern the police service effectively, I think we have to understand what they are about. And I think Andrew Flanagan's governance review, which reported in the spring of 2016, and the many of the recommendations which have been accepted and which have been fairly uncontroversial have really helped us improve, I think. And I joined the board in June of 2015, and we are unrecognisably better than we were. We are still learning. We are still a very young and immature board. I think we would wish to stay responsive. Um, I have great respect for Moy and great respect for her views, and she has expressed them pretty effectively this morning, and she did that to the board. But I don't recognise the characterisation of the board as she describes it. My view of the board, uh, I certainly wouldn't be part of a board that was secretive, that didn't want to engage with stakeholders. I've been in public service for over 32 years as a police officer. I have no axes to grind. My pure ambition and passion is for the Police Service of Scotland to be the very best it can be. Um, I think taking the decision to hold board meetings or committee meetings in private, because we actually hold all our board meetings in public, and all our decisions about everything are now vested in the public meetings of the board. My view and why I, uh, why I elected to support that committee meetings would be in private is because we still do not yet have information flows right. We still do not have strong enough relationships with senior police officers in Scotland, but they are improving. And I think we needed some clear space to be able to consider complex and difficult issues. And please, um, if I could just finish on the final point, I know you want to challenge a few things I'm saying. I would hope that everyone would recognise that if we've got the balance wrong and we need to do more of our committee work in public, then, then we will do that. But I hope that this committee and commentators and indeed HMICS in the review, which they are about to do, recognises that every board needs at least some private space on which to decide and to um, make some decisions and, and to freely debate some of the complex issues and difficult issues that policing is going to face over the next 10 years uh, following the consultation around the 2026 strategy. Thank you, Mr Graham. You mentioned your background in policing, which I'm sure is, is very valuable to the board. Do you have experience of, of other boards, other appointments? No, I don't. This is the first time I've sat on a public board. Yeah. OK. So you do recognise that the board hasn't been performing well? Um, I recognise that the perception that we have created around uh, holding committee meetings in private has had a much bigger impact than I would have expected. But I am not an experienced public board member. I am a, a, a former senior police officer with a passionate ambition to help police in Scotland be the very best it can be. Um, if this is a learning process, this committee process, what we've been through up till now, um, then I, I absolutely accept that, um, that we can still improve, we can still learn. I suspect that for all my time on the board, we will still be improving and learning. Thank you. I'll move on to, to Moy Ali. Miss Ali, I've read the letter that Andrew Flanagan sent you in December after you had raised two objections to part of the governance review. Do you think that that letter amounted to bullying? Yes, I believe that it did. Um, a good leader, if he had any concerns, would surely speak to an individual. I think all of us would do that. To write a letter of that nature, it, it's hard to find another word to describe what it amounts to. And do you feel quite sad about this experience? Do you feel that, that you've been driven out? Yes, I do. It's been a really horrendous experience. I'm quite surprised that five months after receiving the letter, we're still talking about it. It's been a very difficult thing to live through, particularly being outside of, of all of this on my own, not having access to materials. I mean, coming here today, I asked for information from the SPA. Not private information, but information about meetings I attended, um, information that I had previously held. 
um, and I was denied that. So I've been very much pushed to the outside. And actually, what has happened, what's transpired as a result of that letter, is exactly what I said would happen. Um, I, I did seek to have a meeting with, with Andrew Flanagan very quickly, almost immediately after I received the first working day after I received the letter, I asked for a meeting. And for a variety of reasons, um, that simply didn't happen. Thank you. In a previous session, I asked Andrew Flanagan if he recognised that his conduct could be perceived as, as control freakery. Um, he didn't um, accept that characterisation. In the time that I've been um, pursuing these questions, it strikes me that the SPA is very much a, a male-dominated organisation. Do you believe that he would have sent that same letter to a man? No, I don't think he would. It's interesting, after I received it, I spoke to Ian White because he'd expressed very similar views to me at that board meeting. The only difference was that he didn't ask for his to be minuted. In a way, the minuting is irrelevant because it's live streamed and it's recorded for posterity anyway. Um, but he raised very similar issues. I think his words were, I share many of the concerns that Moy has raised. He pushed on the point I pushed on about whether it confirmed with best practice. So I asked Mr White if he had received a similar letter, and he said no, he hadn't. Thank you. Given the letter and, and what you've just said um, in terms of feeling bullied, do you think Andrew Flanagan is fit to continue as chair of the Scottish Police Authority? I'm afraid I don't. I think... He's actually not fit to continue on any public board because he clearly doesn't observe public sector values. However, I think the police authority is in a different league because I think an oversight body that oversees policing has to be has to set even higher standards of corporate governance, and he clearly has not observed those standards. Can I turn to... Brian Barber, you rightfully set out in your statement that the SPA has oversight of £1 billion of, of public spending. Given what Moy Ali has just said, do you believe that Andrew Flanagan is fit to continue in his role? Um, I have no experience of Andrew Flanagan because Andrew joined just after I left. But the, the story that Moy has uh, given here uh, makes me question his suitability for the role. Thank you. Ian White, we've just heard from Moy Ali that you've raised similar concerns as, as Moy did, um, but you didn't receive a letter on Christmas Eve from Andrew Flanagan. Or, or did you receive any letter from Andrew Flanagan? I didn't receive any letter from Andrew Flanagan. Um, the, the, I suppose the difference between what Moy did and what I did, if there was one, was that Moy recorded her dissent to the board decision, and I didn't do that at the meeting, but I don't know why Andrew took a, di a different approach otherwise, uh, but I suppose at that, at that meeting I didn't record my dissent because I accepted that board colleagues wished to make the decision and I accepted that I could go along with that in the round, having questioned and sought assurances around the decision that was being made. So, given what's happened to Moy, I mean, the consequences of recording dissent have been quite serious. It sounds like she's been hounded out. Um, would that put you off recording dissent in future? No, it wouldn't put me off recording dissent. I've recorded dissent in, on a previous public board I was a member of. Uh, we've had votes on the SPA board in the past. Which was that, Mr White? Uh, that was NHS Lothian. It was some many years ago. Did the chair write to you to give you a tailing off? No. OK. So, in that case then, do you agree that Andrew Flanagan has overstepped the mark in sending that letter to Moyali? I don't know any of the background of but the you conversations. you are an experienced public board uh, member. Well, I, I don't know any of the background of the conversations that Moy and Andrew had uh, prior to the meeting uh, or ab about these, these matters uh, individually between themselves. So I don't understand that relationship and what was going on. I think that would be a matter for Mr. you to White, question them. With respect, all the correspondence is now in the public domain. I'm sure you've been following the previous sessions of this committee very carefully, at least I hope that you have been. All the facts are out there. Have you not been paying attention? Uh, I have, but I don't know if there are 
other matters out with the correspondence and possibly conversations that might impact on it. So what could possibly justify Andrew Flanagan's letter to Moy Ali? I don't know. I didn't write the letter. OK. So when Moy Ali says that she feels bullied because she got a letter and other people didn't and other board members are clearly being silent and not prepared to stick up for her, do you think you're complicit in, in the way that Andrew Flanagan has treated Moy Ali? The, the, the letters and the matter were a matter between them. And I understand Moy has, I've been told Moy has taken issues up elsewhere, and clearly it's coming up here. I would have thought uh, that was a matter for due process. But in terms of the board decision, the decision had been made, and Moy chose to resign. Now, I don't know why Moy chose to resign. Uh, I haven't. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm not part of the private deliberations. But if you recall, others. Andrew Flanagan asked her to consider resigning because she was recording her dissent. You do recognise that? I do recognise that, but. Uh, That's I think fine. It's still, I think it's still a, a matter for the individual. And uh, had I been in that position, probably. Well, I don't know uh, how I felt at that time. I don't think I would have resigned. Do you have any regrets about Moy Ali's resignation or the circumstances that may have surrounded it? I, I wasn't close to the circumstances surrounding it. That's fine. But you do recognise that the reputation of the SPA is in crisis? I don't believe it's in crisis. I believe we are an improving board and an improving organisation. So you think you have the, the confidence the of the public? Publication, and the publication. Parliament? Well, that we still have to continue to improve on public confidence in the organisation, and we are uh, working to do that. The publication of the draft 2026 strategy, the public consultation that is ongoing on that, and our efforts to improve the working relationship with senior police officers such that we are taking the strategic direction of policing forward in Scotland is the purpose of the board, and on all of that we are improving, and I expect to see a full strategy published soon that will uh, make uh, for better policing for Scotland. I don't have any more questions for Mr White. OK, Mr Graham, you wanted to come in, but, but perhaps you could, all three of you, given your wealth of experience in, in the public sector, answer this for me. Um, will you collectively um, talk through the principles of on board? And if you were, is your understanding of that, that you can dissent in public, that collective responsibility only applies after a decision has been made, and given the circumstances that surrounds the dispute with Moy Ali, do you have no responsibility for ensuring that the principles of on board are actually met as board members in the SPA? Mr Graham. Yeah, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, convener. Uh, and usefully that question leads into what I wanted to say in relation to Monica. I have great respect for Moy and great respect for her as a board colleague when she was on it. I will, first, I, before you do that. I will convene her, and um, I, I absolutely respect the position she finds herself in and her perception on it. I have no difficulty with that at all. I do not feel qualified, as Ian has described, I do not feel qualified in the detail of what has taken place there. But I can certainly tell you the on-board uh, guidance was given to me at my induction. I have an understanding of, at least a basic understanding of how collective responsibility should work. And I absolutely would dissent from anything. I would give my opinion. And I absolutely agree with Moy that going into a public board meeting, um, I'm not entirely sure all the time of where I will eventually end up on any given issue. It may be that during the debate, I change views. That is entirely the product of a sensible and functional board, in my view, that during the board meeting, you may form a view and you may dissent <coughs> from the general purpose. I also understand that if I do dissent and I cannot live with what the board eventually decides collectively, then I have quite simply a choice to make about whether I can continue the board. So I, I think I understand that. What I'm slightly concerned about is the picture being painted of Andrew Flanagan as the chair, which is, which is in, the, in the singular um, situation which Moy outlines very eloquently. I can absolutely understand that perception, but my experience of him as a chair 
and I feel duty bound to say this, is not as any kind of control freak. It is somebody that wants to engage with other members. It is somebody that wants to bring in people's views and dissent. And he is someone who has said to us repeatedly in public boards, please, please get out what your views are. So I just would want to make sure that we have a balanced view about how Andrew Flanagan is chairing the board. Um, we have, in fact, a letter before us that indicates something quite different to what you've just told this committee. So I would be interested in whether you think that letter, given what you've said about on board, is actually appropriate. And I'll give you a chance to answer that and bring Mr Hume in after. Yes. Um, convener, I'm, I, I do not feel particularly well qualified seeing the letter. It is not... It is not what the way we would want to... I would have hoped that if I had dissented in public, that any chair or indeed any of my colleagues on the board would actually challenge me verbally and say, listen, what, what is going on? Let's have a discussion about that. That is how I would like to do business. That is how I have experienced business before, not necessarily with Andrew. So, but I, I, so I can't say a great deal about the letter, I, but I respect Moy's position on it. I understand why she feels the way she does. Mr Hume. Thank you, Convener. Um, uh, uh, with regard to um, the, uh, the events that we're talking about and, and on board, um, I would say that I fully understand on board. I received a copy when it was published, um, and my interpretation of on board is the same as the one that you outlined. With regard to uh, the other issues, I I regret very much that Moy Ali left the board. Um, she was a very useful uh, and uh, active uh, member in terms of her contributions. Her qual the quality of her contributions were all very good, so I do uh, regret that. Um, with regard to some of the uh, previous questioning and the, the role of the board around this, um, I uh, was aware that, quite rightly, uh, Moy had raised her issues of concern formally through agreed processes and I think there are issues in there that that, that could be teased out perhaps um, on some of the issues that have been raised the interpretation of on board and so on um, that resulted in that process that took place in uh, January and, and February of this year that was outside the SPA and I think like Ian um, because I knew that that process was was uh, in underway, um, then I, I felt that that would bring a resolution to the matter, which is, I think, the, the aim that, that Moy had at the time. OK. Can I bring in Ross Thompson? Thank you very much, um, convener. Um, my first question is to the um, other board members. Um, in evidence, um, Mr Barber said that the board had been passive, only speaking up when forced and relation to current media coverage it had remained silent. So my two questions are, one, has anyone asked you not to comment on any of the media coverage surrounding the work of this committee and the resignation of Moy? And two, if that's not the case, why have you remained silent? I think I'll take Ian White first on that question. We, we work... Uh, collectively as a, as a board, Mr Thompson, and so uh, we come to decisions and we then support those decisions, as in the onboard guidance. At that point, it is not for us individually to make public comments on things, uh, but we may be asked to represent the board in making public comments on the views of the board. So therefore, uh, were I approached by a journalist or others for public comment, I would refer that first to our press office, who would arrange for an appropriate corporate view to be given. And that is as standard with uh, public boards of, a, of the type that the SPA is. Yes, thank you. Sorry. Graham first. Thank you, convener. Um, in response to your first question, no one has asked me not to comment if those double negatives work. Um, so I've not been asked not to say anything. Um, I, I do not feel particularly qualified to comment in a public arena on a matter which took place between two members of the board, the chair and Moy. In fact, I think I may well do more damage if I try to, So I, so that's why I haven't. Thank you. Um, no, nobody has uh, instructed me or, or guided me in, in making comments or otherwise. Um, I would I 
revert to the, the point I made previously, that quite rightly, I think, and I, I know that Moy's here and I don't want to speak for her, but my impression was that she took advice on what she should uh, do to resolve her concerns about that letter. Um, she followed that advice, I think, to the, to the letter, and that process was ongoing. At the end of that process, uh, she uh, decided to resign. Um, and I, I don't feel really that, that I should be setting in train a parallel process to investigate that uh, matter. If there are issues about how that matter was dealt with, then they, ne they need to be dealt with. But the fact is that she followed that advice that she was given, as far as I understand, uh, fully. And that process went uh, through, and then she took her decision at the end of that process. And that was exactly the right thing to do up to that point, although I say again that I didn't, I felt that it was a matter of huge regret that she had decided to resign from the board. Um, I've obviously heard board members express that they're unqualified to comment on the letter, but in evidence, Moy Ali stated this morning that that letter was straightforward punishment for speaking out. And it's quite clear from the evidence as well this morning that there may have been a culture of bullying, uh, particularly in, in this instance. With this going on, does this not inhibit board members from being able to express an opinion that's different, from being able to challenge openly, to express a different view, to record dissent? Has none of this deterred any member from being able to speak openly? Can I say, sorry, that that um, I, I should uh, indicate uh, to the committee that I have previously dissented on two occasions and had my dissent recorded, um, actually on, on the same issue of governance, and that was in June uh, 2015. Um, I can give you my absolute assurance that um, I, I feel in no way inhibited um, I've been in the public service for 35 years. Um, at this stage in my career, I have no intention of being pushed around uh, on matters that I feel uh, are uh, that, that I feel are wrong or inappropriate. And as the chair of the audit committee, I think it's it's vitally important that I uphold these these standards. That dissent was minuted. Is that correct? It was minuted. I have a copy here. Did, if you and did, you receive a letter from the board chair about your dissent being minuted. No, I didn't. No, you didn't. Okay. No, I didn't. Um, could I just note for the record that in the paperwork supplied to us by the Scottish Police Authority, I cannot find evidence of you dissenting. Now, I'm not suggesting that you are telling us anything that is untrue. I'm simply observing that in the paperwork supplied to us, I can't find a note of your dissent. Okay. Can I give you my reassurance? I Absolutely. would never mislead or, or uh, uh, give false claim to this and committee. I have somewhere in this pile a copy of the minute from June uh, 2015, okay. and I can share it with the board. Uh, that would be sorry, very helpful. Thank you. Ross. And just to the, um, um, George and Ian, um, if you think this, um, this entire issue is, is impacted on your own ability to, to challenge. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, uh, throughout my policing career, I, I have experienced some very challenging places where I have felt inhibited uh, through a number of reasons. I, I certainly don't feel that way on the board. In fact, all I would say about our experience on the board is colleagues round the table actually encourage you to share your views and to help us understand why we think a certain way. So my experience of it in the, in the nearly two years I have been on the board has been pretty productive and positive in that people want to get your views. Um, and for my part, I would encourage all of us, I share David's genuine regret that Moy's not with us anymore. She did add uh, a really strong element of challenge and um, different thinking, which I really appreciated. So I, I would like to think, I, I don't think it'll be perfect, like it, all human endeavours aren't, but I would like to think that on the board we do try and encourage different views wherever possible. That's the only value we can really add, and I certainly don't feel inhibited by recent events in saying uh, what I think. Um, convener, sorry, I, I have similar views to my two colleagues. Um, 
I, in fact, if it, if it comes to it, I've had recent conversations with the chair and other colleagues about how we can uh, ensure that we show our challenge uh, openly and in public sessions, because the, the, the nature of them means that they, they can become a little stilted at times. You, you, we, we often end up uh, asking questions of Police Scotland officers who are there. Uh, we probably need to do a bit more of the debate about what we as a board feel about the evidence they're giving us and the information uh, we're assessing before coming to a decision. And uh, we've been encouraged, actually, by the chair and by discussions amongst ourselves to do more of that. So I don't feel inhibited. And in fact, um, if anything, we're looking to be more open about those decisions as we move forward. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a question for, for Moy, um, which is, given your whole experience and given that we need people with experience on boards like the SPA, do you think that this has the potential to dissuade the, the people we need, the talented people that we need, to actually take up roles on boards like the SPA? I think it does. I think it raises a couple of issues. We've heard that dissent has been expressed previously. I can confirm that David's account is correct. In fact, both David and Brian went further than me. They didn't just ask for their dissent to be noted, but they voted against a proposal. So they went further than me and they received no letters. So just to clarify that. But yes, I do think it has an effect. I've been doing a great deal of work in my own time recently around improving diversity on boards. I'm from a minority ethnic background myself, and I've been doing a lot of work with minority ethnic women, because I think Nicola Sturgeon's commitment to 50-50 should not just be about gender, but about ethnicity as well. So I've been doing a lot of work to promote that, but recently I have found it very difficult to advise people to join boards because I'm a very experienced board member. I've sat on public boards, a large number of public boards, for nearly 20 years now. Um, but my recent experience has been so surprising and so traumatic that it's not something that I would immediately recommend. Um, sorry, I've lost the thread of your question. Oh, it was whether I'd recommend. But just to clarify, there was one point where you said that I talked about a culture of bullying. Just to clarify, I don't think there is a culture of bullying in the SPA. Um, in response to Monica Lenz's question, d did I feel bullied? Yes, because my treatment was different to the treatment of other people. Now, you can come up with your own conclusions as to why that was, but I think it was very much focused at me. And clearly, colleagues have not had the same experience in the same situation. Um, but yes, it, it certainly would make me think twice about... Um, I think I would always express dissent, because I take being a board member seriously. But I would feel quite anxious about doing that, and, and that should not be the way that board members feel. Um, ask, uh, to ask Mr um, Graham, um, again, I, I've heard you say that unqualified to talk about you know, the contents um, of, of the letter. So my question would be, should a similar dispute occur, given that members have said they'd be quite confident to record their dissent, that they would be quite confident to, to challenge? Um, could the situation have been handled more appropriately? And what would be the most appropriate way for the board chair to handle such an issue? Yes, thank you. Um, well, clearly, I don't know the detail of, of the conversations that took place are, are quite rightly Andrew and Moy have kept the process fairly confidential, other than the documentation which has been provided to everybody now. I have no sight on it. But my, um, my earnest wish around all of this would be that um, if I was to dissent in such a way and I was to receive a letter like that, I think it would, my view would be we should have a face-to-face -face conversation, a discussion about it. Uh, if Moy had came to me, I think I would have earnestly tried to persuade her to stay with us on the board um, and not resign, but I don't know the detail of that. I can't speak for how she feels. She does that eloquently enough, and I understand why she feels that way. But if this situation was to arise, I think my, my approach would be to confront it head on, sit down and talk it through. I, but I don't know what happened in that particular instance. Convener, um, and this will get, take guidance um, from you, um, listening to, to that answer as well as some of the challenge round about the chair not being fit to continue. You might recall at uh, our last meeting we took evidence from Andrew Flanagan <coughs> and asked him about his thoughts on his own position, of which he thought he was happy and fit to continue. I asked the same of Paul Johnson 
who agreed. Um, and in fact, Paul Johnson said that he's subject to regular performance reviews and the responsibility falls to him uh, and that he wouldn't conduct a review in public, but ongoing performance reviews are undertaken by him. Um, now, I can understand that we cannot have those reviews in public, but there must be a framework or guidelines which we could maybe ask them to make public and available to this committee, which I think might be quite helpful. Um, we can certainly consider that, but as you know, the Justice Subcommittee is taking forward work on this um, in the next week, and it may be something that sure. they properly pick up rather than it being um, for this committee. Perfect. Any further questions, uh, Mr Thompson? One last question, which is to Mr uh, Penman. Um, which is um, the, on his inspection, which will specifically uh, consider um, you know, leadership and governance. And then you also said um, if there was anything else which you th we thought might benefit. Um, will you specifically be looking at the treatment of um, Moy Ali um, and, uh, uh, and understandings of onboard guidance as part of that? Absolutely, in our, in our terms of reference, we would intend to do that. I mean, for me, I think the letter raises two issues. The first, I think, as the convener has highlighted, is about that shared understanding of onboard guidance, the concept of collective responsibility and dissent, uh, and, and I suppose the role of the chair to encourage debate uh, within there. So these are areas that uh, we will look at. I think there are some issues around, perhaps, interpretation of cabinet responsibility, which is things happen in, in, in private and are then played out uh, united, as opposed to collective responsibility and onboard guidance, which clearly allows for that. So in order to do that, we will be working with Audit Scotland um, and we would intend to look at the induction that members have received and we also intend to interview the chair, all members and some senior uh, officers of SBA to check their understanding uh, and application of onboard guidance and to offer a judgment on that within our report. Um, and obviously in today's um, evidence, we'll also look at the consistency um, of that uh, across um, decisions that have been taken recently. The second issue for me is also around the authority of the chair effectively um, to take action with members and, and where that authority is drawn from. Um, and we'll, I think, onboard guidance talks that would come from either legislation or the standing orders of um, the authority. So we've asked for the standing orders of the authority as well, just to understand what are the proper processes to be followed uh, in, in relation to a situation where um, the, the chair uh, is effectively in dispute with uh, a member and how that would be played out. Again, we offer a, a, a commentary and a judgment of that in our report. Thank you. Thanks, convener. Helpful. Uh, Mr Hume, you wanted a well, shot. I, I did thank you, convener. In fact, uh, Derek has just uh, covered exactly okay. the ground that I was going to cover. Um, really, two points that <clears throat> on board is uh, quite quiet, if not silent, on dis dispute resolution. Um, and I think it's to be welcomed that the HMICS review will extend into this area and hopefully promote clarity in that area. I think the other area that there's uncertainty about is the escalation of, of that. And I think, again, some comment from HMICS on how the formal process of resolution um, is carried out and to what effect. I think will be helpful as well. But if the judgment was wrong in the first instance, no amount of dispute resolution is going to get you through that. Would that be fair? Um, no, I don't think that would be fair in every case. I understand the point you're making, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't demur totally from it, but I don't think that's a, a general rule. I think there is obviously the initial issue that gives rise to any dispute. Um, but how we actually deal with that once that's happened is critical, and in this case was critical. And I, when I saw the draft terms of reference from HMICS, I absolutely welcomed that addition to the, the remit. OK. Willie Coffey. Thank you, convener, and good morning, everybody. I'm a relatively new member of the committee, but did serve on the committee a number of years ago, and colleagues are pretty well so far covering the historical journey that we've made to this point. I'm interested, I think, as a new member, in focusing on what's happening now, the here and now, and trying to get some kind of sense of assurance, reassurance from everyone around the table about the current quality and arrangements for scrutiny. Um, do, do you think, Mr Penman, do you think that correct and proper and thorough scrutiny arrangements are in place at the moment? And does the board member, do the board members think currently that the SPA is doing a good job or a better job at holding Police Scotland to account? Because I feel that's the key question that the public will be wanting to receive some assurance of at the moment, and obviously through Mr Payman's review. 
Um, thank you for that. I mean, our, our review, and it'll be the, the larger review, will look in, in great detail around the um, leadership and governance and, and other aspects of the authority, and that would allow us to effectively um, provide a, a judgment um, on that. Um, I'm conscious of the evidence the Chair, I think, gave this committee, which I think he himself recognised that there was still some room for improvement, and improvement still has to be done, and I would, I would share that view. But I, I would also share um, the, the views, I think, that Mr Graham has put forward, you know, around that there, there has been some improvement within um, the board. Um, the, the Chair has brought out the, um, the, the, his, um, his review. Um, there was much to be commended within that review, I think, in terms of protocols and, and how the governance of, of the, the group um, would meet. The Chair has also improved the relationships with um, Police Scotland quite significantly, and I think that's manifested itself in the, the, the joint work to produce the 2026 strategy. So there is, I think, positive signs uh, around that, and there are also new members who have been recruited. But uh, it's also clear that the authority must have the confidence of the public, and I think you know, um, there's, there's reassurance that has to be provided quite quickly um, in, in relation to that, and hopefully the review that we do will be able to do that. Mr Graham. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you very much for, for that question. Um, I, I would like to say something about the Police and Fire Reform Act and the responsibilities it places on the police authority. Very often we focus on the notion of scrutiny and holding to account. It is a very important part of what the police authority do, but it's not everything. Um, I keep reminding anyone that's willing to listen that our responsibilities are first and foremost to maintain the police service in Scotland but also to champion or promote policing principles across Scotland. In other words, to be a supporter and an encourager as well as a challenger. Um, some of that, I think, the ma vast majority of the scrutiny and the challenging and supporting can be done in public, but an awful lot of the relationships that you need to be able to do that effectively in public need to be formed in private. So um, I, I go back to what I said at the outset, that I think there needs to be a balance. I, I would suggest that we have maybe tilted the balance in favour of the developing relationships and not enough about the perceptions of how the authority are performing its duty. And we may need to redress that. In fact, I'm pretty sure we do need to redress that um, and do more of our challenging and scrutinising and supporting in public. Um, but I do think that not only 2026, but some of the work that we're doing in the performance framework to actually get a clearer understanding of what really is police performance and not just crime figures to get a better understanding of how localism should work, how local police can respond to and engage with local communities. I think getting under the skin of that's better. How the new command and control <coughs> processes are going to work now that we are going from what was eight control rooms across Scotland into, into three, basically, in a national uh, inquiry unit. How all of that knits together and properly serves the public um, needs to be demonstrated and demonstrated uh, over the next few years. So I think we do that best. Um, by understanding how the police service work and then properly scrutinising and encouraging in public. Mr Hume, did you want to? I, I did, thank, thank you. you very much. Um, I, I think the whole issue of scrutiny is, is absolutely critical to what we do. Um, as George said, uh, and as the Act says, we are there to support policing, but that scrutiny is, is a key part of, of what we do. Um, the remarks I wanted to make actually refer to the pre-existing situation before December, because I think it's my view that the previous committee system was not working efficiently or effectively. Um, and I had criticised that from a number of perspectives. And so I welcomed the governance review. Uh, for me, coming from a, a local authority background, I thought the, the chair's proposals were interesting because actually in a local authority context, they mirrored the changes that the Macintosh review brought in in the early 2000s, where local authority committees were, um, were done away with and replaced in most of Scotland for that time with an executive scrutiny model. And my interest in that area was to see whether the, this would improve the scrutiny, reduce the waste uh, uh, and the ineffectiveness of a, a very expensive committee system that, that was in place. And the selling point for me at that stage was that it was agreed that we would have a six-month review period, and I wanted to place myself in that, in that position to carry out the review of the six months. I knew at that stage that uh, HMICS were going to conduct a review, and I felt that this represented potentially something that we should look at as a way of improving scrutiny, increasing effectiveness, and carry out a thorough review on the basis of the evidence that we collected. Now, um, 
around that, we knew uh, through a discussion that I had with Moy that we negotiated for um, an internal audit review to be carried out in the second quarter of the year. We knew that HMICS um, were uh, intending to carry out a review getting into the late summer, early autumn of the year. And we were beginning to build a, an appreciation of the interest that Audit Scotland had in governance and transparency. So it seemed to me at that stage that given the previous system wasn't working, that we needed to improve the effectiveness of our scrutiny, that this represented something to look at, to carry out and collect evidence about, to review uh, and ensure that we could set a standard against a known standard for good governance and openness and transparency. So that was the, the kind of pathway that I thought we were embarked on in, in December. And it's one that, that I hope we could, well, with the, the reviews, I'm convinced we'll get through to that uh, stage uh, with the, the assistance of these uh, other external agencies. I mean, could I say as well, I mean, that quite a lot of the issues that, that Moy and Brian raised don't need to wait for a review to, to have some of those issues addressed. Could, could you possibly tell us of some of the issues that they raised and have been raising over the last weeks and months, where have those kinds of or issues been addressed and where have those improvements taken place within the current arrangements? I would hate to think, convener, that we're just sitting waiting for the review to solve everything. Sometimes these are interpersonal relationships that can improve by working together and discussing and resolving things and we don't need to wait for a formal review. So where, where have some of the issues that, that have been raised by our colleagues here been dealt with currently by the board and where have the improvements taking place? Uh, Mr Graham, uh, well, Mr Hume. It wasn't my intention to say that everything is put on hold until these reviews. I was talking about the, the new form of governance, which, which I felt required some evidence to be pulled together um, and for these issues to be scrutinised within a relatively short period. But I would also agree with comments that other uh, people have made at this end of the table about the continuing improvements there has been over the last year uh, in the way that the board is operating, in the way it's scrutinising, in the way it's being responsible for the uh, budget that we have. Because I think if you take the, the, uh, the if you like, the, the um, oversight of the, the budget, which is over a billion pounds, um, I think we're in a much better position now in terms of having a, a proper cost base and a, an understanding of that budget uh, now than we have been previously. And I think going forward, there is a much greater understanding and unanimity of the board around the challenge of transformation that's facing policing. And that, that's all been happening on a month by month basis over, over the last year or so. But could I, I wonder if I could ask Mr White to come in on that as well, Jackie, and this will be my, my last question. But supposing that some other issue arises along the same lines that, that Moy has raised, and you guys are still on the board, but what's the kind of nature of relationship to, to try and prevent circumstances like that happening again? I, I guess that the, we'll never be able to repair the damage that Moy and perhaps Brian Fuel has been, has been carried out. So if something were to happen again like this, in the current board, in the current setup, how would you deal with it now? That's what I'm trying to get a sense of. Could this happen again? Are, are there arrangements improving and better in place now to, to try and deal with this better? The difficulty I have about that question is that this situation was so unusual compared with our normal discussions uh, <laughs> in, in a sense that our members' meetings are, and I know you've had some dialogue with the chief executive about the nature of our members meetings our members meetings are there to allow a lot of that discursive space uh, to, to be available to us and I would say that a lot of that has been used to uh, for, for us to come to agreement on what approach we want to take uh, with Police Scotland and others about how we, we challenge and how we, we bring matters forward. But it's also by including Police Scotland from time to time at appropriate times in, in more private discussions allowed us to get them to a place where they're providing us appropriate information, where there's a shared understanding of the information we need to do our job and how that can be taken forward. And, and we've seen through the development of the 2026 strategy and 
through our development of a longer term financial plan to bring uh, the SPA and Police Scotland back into balance, uh, a much better understanding of these things. And, and I suppose it shows up in some of the public papers where you will start, we hope, to see uh, a much better uh, business cases put forward for change and uh, an agreed approach where we encourage Police Scotland to uh, work with us and the public to come forward with what they need from policing, to work to the police priorities, to set an agenda that we agree and the holding to account bit becomes about us holding them to account for delivering that. And you mentioned the holding to account at the start. It's, it's about holding them to account for delivering an agreed strategy and the performance that sits behind that. OK, th thank you, Camille. I'll have to give other colleagues a chance. OK, I wonder, much. before I turn to Colin Beattie, whether I could just raise something with David Hume, because my understanding of the Macintosh model is that committees in local government were removed and replaced by this executive scrutiny model. Um, is it not the case that committees continue within SPA, but they're simply in private now? Well, that's a good, a good point, and I think that's okay. true. Um, it's analogous in the sense that um, although in local government, my experience of it was that the, the committees were removed with the exception of education and certain aspects of regulation and so on. Um, nonetheless, working groups continued so that, that uh, policy and policy options could be explored. And, and by their nature, they were conducted in, in private. There weren't public meetings. And these were taken forward. I understand my concern that actually the committees, you know, as described previously, still remain, albeit they may have been restructured and called well, something else. No, no um, the analogy still holds, I think, um, convener, I'm, with respect. I'm not sure. OK, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring in Colin Beattie now. Okay. Um, if I can help my colleague. Mr. Hume, on, on this, I think the key and critical thing <laughs> Uh, that, that gave me some reassurance about this when we made that decision, and we, we should be reviewing it, uh, was that we agreed that any decision-making processes would be taken at the full board okay. in public let, with uh, let, let me ask you oversight then about of, the reassurance of you received. Let me ask you about that reassurance, because I understand a review was undertaken by the chief executive of whether your you know, processes were transparent, were, were um, how you compared yourselves with other bodies, and he came back and reported to the board that you were the best, or amongst the best. Do you believe that to be true now? Did you believe him at the time, given your experience of public se the se public sector? I asked him in public for his view, and I was given a reassurance. I believe it's correct in terms of as many as possible of our decisions are taken in oh, public. OK, so heavily caveated well, then as to I, I, in what way you I have based. challenged, and, and <coughs> we've heard, we've, we've talked this morning about whether there has been challenge. I have challenged in a number of places, and, and uh, sometimes it seems to be minuted, sometimes not, but I have challenged some of the assertions through the governance review about what went on. Uh, what, what was conducted in public and private. The minutes, suggest, also the minutes suggest that the view, maybe not of all of you, but that's not recorded, but the view of the chief executive expressed to the board yes. is that you were amongst the best. So yeah. I just let that rest there. Yes. Um, Colin Beattie. Thank you, Vera. Um, Mr Barber, it's some time now, of course, since you left the board, but you were there during a fairly critical period when the board was initially set up. Is that correct? That's During the first year or so. Um, during that time, did committees meet in private during that period? Uh, as a principle, during that time, committees met in public, but there were also private sessions. And the default position that uh, I certainly as chair of the audit committee at the time tried to encourage was things should be public unless there was a good reason for them to be in private. And I was somewhat surprised at the, the governance review because D David Hume, who, as you know, was one person who publicly dissented on a vote uh, at a meeting uh, that we attended, um, was also a proponent for a default position of everything should be in public unless there's a documented rationale for being in private. Thank you. You've made a couple of assertions here which are obviously of great concern. One is about um, effectively political intervention and about 
items disappearing from agendas. Obviously, this committee works on the basis of evidence. Do you have any evidence of this happening? In terms of um, interference, uh, if I go back to the very early days of setting up Police Scotland, the Chief Constable and the SPA agreed at a meeting in the Beardmore of allocation and division of responsibilities. That agreement was put in writing, uh, made, made in a private session between SPA and Police Scotland, and was subsequently unwound. And uh, it was unwound because of government intervention. Now, when I say government there, it's political stroke uh, government officials. But certainly, I would hope colleagues here could confirm that um, what we decided was changed within a number of months. In terms of you, so I'm going to ask you, answer your second question. In terms of items disappearing from agenda, my recollection is that round about December 2014, we were asked to share draft agendas with the, with the government, uh, as against just sharing the the proposed agenda uh, when it had been finalised. During that first year or so, there was a considerable amount of uh, issues within SPA and Police Scotland. Would you have expected the government to become involved in that? I would expect the government as a key stakeholder to be wanting things to work to the best. I wouldn't have expected intervention that actually almost gave direction, but without it being a direction that had to come in front of Parliament. Can I ask uh, the other board members whether they have any evidence on this? George Gray. Yeah, thank you, convener. Thank you for the question, Colin. Um, I'll declare an interest in the example which Brian has given. I was uh, at HMICS at the time when these challenges were taking place. Um, it, it, you could describe this as government interference, HMICS interference. You could describe it uh, in a number of different ways. The reality was it is similar to what is happening just now. HMICS is taking a position on certain things and will make recommendations. I certainly had a different view uh, as HMICS about governance responsibilities and made that fairly clear uh, in the early days of Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority, which caused, again, some discussions, debates and a change of track. I think most of this is well documented and I think particularly uh, understood as part of the history of the SPA's development. So you could describe this as inter interference, if you like. I don't see it as that. I see it as legitimate stakeholders, including myself within the HMICS. Uh, organisation at that time making a view known about how governance should and could work, and it was about the proper division of responsibilities between government, between Scottish Police Authority, and between Police Scotland, and, the, and who had responsibility for what, which is now documented in, a, in the terms of governance. Do any of the other board, or yourself, or any of the other board members, have any evidence on items disappearing from agendas? I have uh, no evidence of, of that, and certainly, if I had been aware of um, that kind of interference, then I wouldn't have accepted it. Um, but I have absolutely no evidence of, of that. Um, I think the SPA, particularly in the early days, had a complex process of negotiation with a whole range of stakeholders, and you would expect that. But in any relationship in um, public administration of that sort, there are, there are lines that, that you don't cross, and if they are crossed, then there are actions that you can take um, to um, raise concerns. So I have no evidence of that, and I have no recollection of anybody raising uh, serious um, concerns at that time. Mr. Hume, just continuing on the governance, my understanding is that you are due to complete the SPA's own review of governance in June? Um, yes. How is that going to fit in with... Uh, Mr. Penman's inspection. Well, you might have noted a note of hesitancy in my voice before I said yes. Um, and as we are developing this and as um, the uh, other uh, reviews are becoming clear, um, we will be undertaking a review within that period, but it's gonna, it, it will go beyond that period. Um, in, um, it had long been, once I knew that um, that HMICS were going to carry out a review that we had committed to a six-month review period, I thought from my past experience and good audit practice that when you're uh, uh, facing a serious audit, then the, the essential thing is to carry out your own audit, 
to look at where you're strong and where you're weak and develop an improvement plan so that the audit team coming in has a basis for taking that and using it as it sees fit and develop. And that was certainly my hope and intention at the time, and that's still my hope and intention. Um, we will carry out and collect evidence up to that period. There will be a report at our board in June, but I think it will go beyond that, because I think related to something the convener asked about where we sit alongside other bodies, what I want to do is to go beyond this, to get to a standard where we can benchmark ourselves against an international standard of good governance that's been articulated. Um, and we'll be doing that with consultation with HMICS and, and Audit Scotland. So there will be a report at the, um, at the June board, but this work is going to go beyond that, I think, into the, into the autumn at least. Mr Penman, just, uh, just on, on the question of your inspection, what powers do you have? If you, if you find that there are problems, you, you're, you're dissatisfied with some aspects, you'll obviously bring that out in your report. What powers do you have to enforce that? Um, I have powers under statute, which will effectively allows me to do anything I consider necessary or expedient. So it's, it's quite a, a high-level power in terms of going in to look and seek information from that. Uh, I have the power to make recommendations to the Chief Constable and to the Chair of the Police Authority. And under statute, they have an obligation to have regard to my recommendations um, from there. Uh, I can't direct them to follow the recommendations, but if I consider that them not following them would effectively have an impact on efficiency or effectiveness, I can report to the Cabinet Secretary or Scottish Ministers, and Scottish Ministers can direct the authority. What do witnesses think about these powers? Are they, are they sufficient? Is it sufficient to uh, ensure that SBA does come out of this uh, a stronger, better organisation? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I would say this, but... Um, I think we would be very foolhardy to ignore recommendations of an HMICS inspection. I think if uh, the, the thoroughness and professionalism with which these inspections are done, if it comes up with recommendations, I, uh, I would be very surprised if we got to a position where we had to be directed by anyone. I think we would recognise the sense in the, in the review and the recommendations, and I think I could, other board members may have a, a view they wish to express, but I would certainly be wanting to um, fulfil the terms of the recommendations. Well, I think you had. Yes, I really wanted to respond to the comment about being foolhardy in, in ignoring um, HMICS recommendations. I believe that HMICS did write to the board before this decision was taken, albeit that we didn't know that he'd written, um, but we were certainly aware of, of the concerns that he had, and they were ignored. So. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure that those two... I know there's a difference between a formal recommendation and a strong expression of feeling, advice, however you want to term it. And actually, I think we're only in the situation that we're in now because the views of HMICS and other stakeholders was ignored, and I think that was foolhardy. Mr Penman, you're, you're probably aware of that letter that uh, you sent to uh, the chair. Would you have expected that to be seen by the board? Um, I think it's actually explicit in the letter where I said it was written solely for the purpose of making members aware of the concerns I had ahead of the decision they were making on the Thursday. I think I wrote on the Friday, so I, I did have an expectation at least it would be shared by members and members would be aware um, of that. And members of the board, of course, did not receive it? Uh, no, but uh, it would be fair to say I have meetings with HMICS on a fairly regular basis. I was fully aware of uh, concerns. I wouldn't say there were recommendations when I... I think it would be foolhardy, and I repeat that expression, it would be foolhardy to ignore a recommendation following a thorough review from HMICS. It is a very different proposition to, um, to think, because a number of stakeholders have different views, which we tried to find a balance on. So um, my distinction is I was fully aware of uh, Mr Penman's views on the holding of public and private. I hope, I may be proven wrong, but I hope that following the thoroughness of the review, there is at least some recognition that the board and the authority still has the capacity to have at least some of its meetings in private, because I still hold the view that that is very important that we have that capacity. Right, Mr Hume, whether they were similarly aware 
of these concerns, yes, can in I, spite of not seeing a letter. Yes, can I say absolutely that I uh, went into that meeting fully aware of the concerns of, of HMICS. Um, I had the benefit of, of uh, George informing uh, the meeting of these concerns. Uh, Moy similarly informed the meeting and had the benefit of a conversation with HMICS about these matters. Um, to, to ask if we were foolhardy, I, I would say uh, no. Uh, I think we would have been foolhardy if we had made um, a, a, a permanent decision to move to a new uh, arrangement in December. Um, and I wouldn't have supported it on that basis if it had been, because that was the, the basis of my previous dissent. Um, I felt that um, by giving ourselves a six month review, it allowed us to address some of the issues that were absolutely clamant at that time. Um, and it gave ourselves the chance to collect evidence because at that stage I felt that um, the discussion about the pluses and minuses with regard to the new governance system were being made on the basis of opinion. And I, I wanted I, to actually collect some evidence so that we had a proper basis for making that decision to address some of the issues that we had. So are you saying your review was actually resulting from the concerns from the inspector? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, but they weren't dissociated with it. It was part of the agreement in December to move forward that there would be a six-month review. And on the basis of, uh, as I indicated previously, we were aware of the concerns that HMI CS had expressed. And we, and we were also aware at that time that, um, that a, a full review would be carried out by uh, HMI CS. Yes, I just want to clarify that, um, that while board members were aware of HMICS's concerns, it's very important to note that they were not aware as a result of either the chair or the chief executive informing the board. They were aware because a number of us, I think interestingly actually the four of us around this table, came across Derek in various meetings and Derek shared his views with us and we then raised those with the board. Um, and I think you'll see that from the minutes. Nowhere did the chair or the chief executive share the concerns of HMICS with the board. And I would expect the chief executive to advise the board and the chair to lead the board. And that information did not come from either of those two. The other point about evidence, uh, having an evidence base before changing things is that actually the board should have had that evidence base before deciding to move from public to private meetings and the evidence base was not there. So if having an evidence base is important, then surely that applies as much to the December meeting as well. Okay. Okay. Alex Neal. Can I start with the Mr. Barber? <coughs> Mr. Barber, in your written submission, you say in relation to the selection of a new chief constable, that your real worry was that interested parties identify a preferred candidate and try to influence the selection criteria accordingly. Can you be, be, be more specific? It was a general fear of mine, and I was sharing my thoughts. I, that, that memo was written to the chair on the day I left the SPA. I hadn't yet met him, so it was, uh, here are my thoughts and, uh, on moving forward, things that were good about the board and things that needed to be changed. Um, in that, I was expressing concern that we had had regular intervention, and it was a legitimate worry of mine that people may be wanting to fit the criteria to the person rather than the board being absolutely clear of the the criteria for the right chief constable and then going through the interview process and seeing who matched the criteria. So these, well, these people you're referring to members of the board? Uh, no, these people I'm referring to was again external influence out with the board. I think the, the board were right. Talking about? Uh, I'm talking particularly about uh, government and uh, in government I mean both the political side and the official side. So you know, were you talking about the civil service? Civil service and, uh, and potentially uh, if the cabinet secretary had expressed an interest, but I wasn't privy to that kind of discussion. Do you have any evidence of this? No, I was, that's why I was expressing that was a worry. I, had, I wasn't saying I've got evidence to say it's happening. Right. I was being open with the chair and saying it's a concern of mine. Right. But I think to be fair in your submission, you should have made it clear that you didn't have any evidence. It was just a feeling. 
Well, that's why my letter to the uh, I took an extract of my email to the chair, yeah. and that's a, that's a verbatim extract from my email, right. and it was my real worry. Not I've seen evidence. I was very yeah. specific. But, but obviously, worries publicly concerned should should be evidence backed. Oh, well, indeed. Yes. Yeah. Can I go to Mo Ali uh, and ask Mo? Uh, it, this morning you said Mo that you had uh, for this meeting sought information which is publicly available from the SPA um, and you were refused that. Can you t give us an indication of what information it was, who refused it and why? Yes. First to clarify, it was not publicly available but it was readily available to the SPA. In other words, it wouldn't be onerous for them to produce it. But it wasn't I mean, it wasn't marked private and confidential. I, I don't know. I, it was of private meetings um, but there were meetings that I attended so I wasn't asking them for information that I would not have and um, I'll, I'll give you examples I wanted um, the October November and December audit committee minutes for example um, I wanted the the minutes of the members meetings we've received extracts here but I actually wanted the full minutes of those um, I wanted earlier drafts because one in particular has changed very significantly. I had two earlier drafts, and they're very different to the one that you had. So it was really for me to get the complete picture. Um, the reason I was given for being refused them was that it was very important to have a level, level playing field and for everybody to have the same information. And I said that I understood that. I was perfectly happy for everybody to have that. And in fact, my concern was that there wasn't a level playing field because my colleagues here have that information. I used to have it because I had an SPA BlackBerry and an iPad and the information's there, but because I no longer have that, I was the one who didn't have it and there they do have it and yet the argument about a level playing field was being used to deny me information that I was then told that if my colleagues asked for it, I would be given it, but they wouldn't ask for it because they have it. So it was a complete catch-22 and as late as six o'clock last night, I received further in, uh, a further email saying that some of the information would be made available to me under a, a subject access request which I'd had to make, but obviously they have 40 days in which to comply with that, so, which is no use for me for today's meeting. So the level playing field suggests they saw this as a bit of a bun fight between you and the other board members, presumably? I think they, they, their feeling is that I'm on the outside and therefore I no longer have the same rights as my former colleagues to information that I previously held. And, I, I, and that clearly is not a, whether you want to call it a bun fight or whatever, but certainly I am at a disadvantage compared, if you look at, I've got this and my colleagues have files of information. And, and who, who refused this? The chief executive refused it. The chief executive refused it? Okay. Yes, I, I did go via Scottish Government because I, I, on a previous occasion when I'd asked for information, it was shredded after I made the request. So on this occasion I went via Paul Johnston. Tell me about that. You, you made an earlier request for information. Not to do with this committee, but my only other occasion when I asked the SPA for information, they... The chief executive wrote to me, I can produce the email, I'm happy to do so, saying that it had been securely disposed of. After you'd made the request? After I'd made the request, yes. So what was this information? This was information, uh, I mean, this is the, pre I, I stress it's the previous chair, but the same chief executive. Yeah. But I had asked for information um, where I, the chair had said that I was a one-trick diversity pony. And... Was that the previous chairman? The previous chair. And I, uh, he said, it's, it isn't me saying that, it's HMICS. And I said that I didn't believe that that was the case and I didn't believe that HMICS would use that terminology and I wanted to see the information. And he said that I couldn't have it, so I made a formal So, so was, this, was this written information? It, he read, he read <coughs> from a piece of paper, yes. So was it a minute of a meeting or something like that? It, it, was, um, it was part of the appraisal process. So there was a document that he read from that said this, and I asked for that information and was th on three occasions and was told I couldn't have it. So when I made a formal request, 
The chief executive wrote to me and told me that it had been securely disposed of. So who was the author of that disgusting statement? The, pre the previous chair. The previous chair? Uh, sorry, that has been, it has that, uh, was part of a whole process that has been dealt with. So well, I'm how, not... Was, how was it dealt with? Well, I think the outcome of that was that the... I, I was not the only person with concerns, and other board members had concerns, and Scottish Government addressed that issue. How, how did they address it? The chairs, yes, thank you. No, but it wasn't over that particular issue, was it? I, I mean, I, I think that was part of. I think that's that quite serious. It. If a chief executive of a public body presides over, um, well, first of all, the, the original phraseology um, is clearly unaccept totally unacceptable. Uh, for the chief executive, if you're saying the chief executive uh, had that destroyed after. Sorry, uh, just to clarify, he didn't destroy it. He wrote to me informing me that it had been destroyed and I asked for information about who and when and why and, and didn't receive that information. But I don't think the Chief Executive destroyed it. But my point was that having previously tried to get information that was important to me and knowing what could happen to it because it had happened and I mean I'm happy to produce the email that right. says this. But, but just to be clear, it was destroyed after you had made yes. the, the request. Yes, that's correct. I think we need to get much more information in that convener because that's totally unacceptable. Even although it's historic, it, is, it shows you know, the chief executive is still the chief executive and if he's prepared to do that, there's something very serious in the organisation. But he didn't... To no, my knowledge, not, he didn't No, he didn't it. do it. No, but, no, no. but nevertheless, um, he's the accountable officer. Yes. Clearly, yes. Um, it should not have happened. Very clearly, it yes. should not have happened. So it was the chief executive who refused you the information for so today's he, meeting. That's correct, yes. Right. I, I wrote to him <coughs> via Scottish Government, because Scottish Government were aware of the previous issue. I spoke to Paul Johnston following this meeting here um, and explained to him, he, he was aware of what had happened previously, and I said, given what happened before, I actually don't have confidence that I'll be given the information I need. And he said, well, that's fine, you can make the request through me. So I wrote to him, set out the information that I required, and he then made the request, and some days went by and I hadn't received it, and it was very straightforward information. And I chased it up, and I was told that the chief executive was about to leave the office and he wouldn't be in on the following Monday. And I said it was urgent because I was going to be working in London. I needed the information to prepare for this. And a lot of emails went to and fro, and Scottish government were involved, and they spoke to me and they spoke to the chief executive, and they were very supportive and helpful. But they didn't. They were unable to secure the information that I needed, and I, I, all I have is the information that is in the public domain now on this committee's website. I don't, I don't have the information. I don't have any of the information that I asked for. Can I ask the three non-executive directors what are you going to do about this? It's clearly unacceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, firstly, can I just reassure members and Moy, I don't feel like I'm in a bun fight with Moy Ali. She's a former colleague and I very much respect her position. Um, I, 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 I don't feel like I'm in a bun fight. I don't feel I have got a whole host of information. I've got my opening statement and that's it. But I do respect that yesterday um, the clerk to this committee put a note out saying, no more information, please. There was so much coming in. So Mr. I suspect... Graham, Mr. Graham, could yep. you ask, answer the question? Yes. What are you going to do about the refusal to give Moali the information and about the fact that the chief executive um, didn't appear to, um, you know, that first incident didn't appear to <coughs> get rid of the paperwork himself, but somebody within the organisation clearly did after a request was made. That's very serious. For an organisation that you've been telling us all morning is running well, full of improvement, and everything's above board and open and transparent, it's anything yeah. but. I think you make a number of assertions there um, that I haven't made. I don't think it's running well, well and everything's above board. I know we can improve and I know we can get well, better. What are you so please, do, well, what are you going to do about if, this? If you let me answer, please, that would be helpful. Um, 
about this, in relation to the information that Moyes asked for yesterday, well, all I can do is research why that was the case, why the situation happened the way it did, and see if we can put that right. I don't know why that information was refused. I don't know uh, enough about it. But I can undertake here to have a look into that and see the historical issue that I think Moy has raised. Again, I don't know anything about that, but uh, if that is something which Moy wishes to raise again, then, uh, of course, we would explore that and make yeah. sure that that kind of thing didn't happen. It's certainly... It's not the kind of thing, as is described, that historical situation. That's not the kind of thing. That's not the way that we in the SBA would, the SBA would like our our um, officials to deal with information well, requests. Well, clearly, like that. clearly, that appears to be happening. Obviously, you've got to find out the other side of the story before you decide what you want to do about it. But I need a guarantee from the three non-executives that this just cannot be allowed to happen with no investigation and appropriate action because. Clearly, it breaches every rule, every principle in the book about openness and transparency. Yeah, I, I can certainly give you that reassurance that, that we will explore this situation. Yeah, yeah we, we can happily go back to the chief executive and question and, I mean, why that information hasn't been provided. you come back to us and tell us what's happening provided. about it. Uh, yes, and uh, I'm sure we can ask the chief executive to provide you Absolutely. with full detail Absolutely. Well, I think that. we should bring him back to the committee, um, actually. But, it convener, if I might say, the, the previous incident that Moy mentioned was, uh, my understanding of that was subject to a complaints process and there was an outcome to that. And I think, as Moy has indicated, she was... I don't know if she's content, but she understands the outcome to that, and so the matter had been dealt with through a, an historic process. Let, let me just address a comment from Mr Graham, because I think it's important to do so. Um, the committee requested full minutes. What we were provided with were extracts. So if the chief executive and his staff can take the time to simply just extract all the information, he can surely take the time to provide information to others. Um, we put a time bar on our information because it's disrespectful to members of the committee to expect at the 11th hour to provide bundles more information that is not urgent. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Just to add to that, can be there, can I ask that we get a copy of all the information that Mo Ali asked for and was refused. Uh, and secondly, um, can I ask the non-executive directors about, uh, I think both Mr White and Mr Hume have confirmed that they had dissented uh, on certain issues at, at the board meeting, as had Mo Ali, but it didn't appear in the minutes. Well, so, so can, can I I clarify that? Um, my uh, dissent was in relation to a previous uh, discussion about governance, which took place in June 2015, and I said that at the time. And I have now here in front of me uh, the minute from that meeting, where um, there were two decisions, and uh, with regard to the first decision, Brian Barber and I uh, are recorded as dissenting. And in the second... In the second decision, I'm showing uh, right. myself as, as dissenting. Right. So I have that it's, here. It's not been. I think. I convener that I, I I indicated that I had raised a number of questions at different points, but I had not recorded dissent to the decisions that were made. We have not received any of that information. I don't, don't doubt the veracity of what you're telling us, but it is the SPA chief executive has chosen not to provide us with that information. Is the only conclusion I can draw. Mr Penman, you wanted to come in, then back to Alex. Neal. Just briefly to give you an assurance that we will request and will review all the minutes uh, unredacted and no extracts from them, and clearly it will be a matter for yourself whether they're released publicly, but we'll look at that, and we'll also include the comments that have been made today in terms of um, historic and consistency. I think that's very helpful. Alex Neil. I, I think that would be very helpful indeed. I mean, clearly, um, presumably this wasn't made under a formal FOI, but nevertheless, um, it clearly it appeared to be a reasonable request that should have been fulfilled. And, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that this behaviour is part of the problem and the culture of the organisation, that it would appear to be, which the culture is one of secrecy and non-cooperation uh, with people, uh, which is not acceptable. I think Mr White wanted to come back in. Mr. Mr. I, I don't know the details of why the Chief Executive has uh, put forward certain parts and, and not others from minutes. All I can tell you is that some of the minutes I think that Moy requested were from private meetings. Uh, 
and some were from members' meetings. There would be, amongst the issues discussed, sensitive matters that may relate to uh, security issues that could not be released publicly. And there may also be financial and commercial discussions in there that would obviously be exempt from FOI uh, and because they would uh, be to the detriment of uh, the, the public service where they released. And it may be uh, something to do with that. I don't know, but I would ask that the committee handle any information sensitively for those reasons. Need a robust request and not getting fussed with their excuses as a non-executive director. Your role is no. to challenge Ab and be Absolute. robust. Absolutely. Seems as though you may have and made your mind up already. No, I, I'm conscious that some of the things in those meetings may be appropriately uh, held in private, even under FOI legislation. Can I say, you know, with all due respect, and I, I hear absolutely what you say, um, but they are extracts that only deal with governance, nothing else. We requested minutes. Had there been a request to redact certain things that were sensitive, I'm sure the committee would have looked at that um, and considered that as appropriate. There is nothing like that in those minutes. Um, and so, you know, the fact that your dissension and Mr Hume's dissension are not recorded is actually not helpful to the consideration of the committee, and I do hope you will take that back to now, the SPA. I'll clarify yet again, I've said this twice now, uh, the, the dissent that Mr Hume is talking about was recorded in a public meeting yep. uh, back in June 2015. I did not record dissent okay. at any point, and I've said that twice, and I'd okay. like to clarify that. You'll make sure that's in our minutes. Hey, can okay. I... <laughs> <laughs> Carry on, Mr Neil. Can, can I just... I want to focus in on the role of non-executive directors, having been a non-executive director of a number of companies myself, and obviously you're operating in the public sector. Uh, can I first of all start with the letter from Derek Penman to the chair prior to the December board meeting? Um, despite the explicit request in the letter, which has been confirmed this morning by Mr Penman, that he had made an explicit request to the chair that the letter be circulated to the board for this meeting. Not only was it not circulated, the chief executive wasn't even informed by the chair at the time of the existence, let alone the contents of the letter. So can I ask you three, when did you find out about this letter? When did you get to read it? Have you read it? Yes, I, I have it in front of me. Um, when did you get it? I, I, I can't recall. Um, it oh, wasn't here's at the time. collective amnesia again. No, no, it, no, no, it's, it's not. It's it must not be, that. Amnesia must be contagious in no, the SBA. I, no, that, that's, that's not the case. Um, so roughly, I, roughly, said, when, roughly when did you get it? I, I, in, in recent times. Well, what, how recent? Well, uh, uh, I, I think I mean, was it last week, last month? Did I, you get I it in December? It within, Did you get it in January? I, I don't date stamp uh, material that I get, but I think it was within the last month. But um, I would say that, um, as I said earlier, that, that we had a, a full discussion about the I, view I, from HMIC. I've heard all that. I've yeah. heard all that. That's not my question. Can you, Mr Graham and Mr White tell me when you got this? Have you read the letter and when did you get a copy? Uh, yes, I've now read the letter, the full detail of which was apparent to me about two or three weeks ago. Ex exactly the same for me. I have a copy right. of it with me, but I hadn't seen it until uh, this issue arose at right. your committee. So my next question is the obvious one. You are non-executive directors, eh, and part of your function is to hold, make sure the board is above board, transparent, it's all in your remit, it's all in the nine principles referred to earlier. Um, when did you ask the chairman why you hadn't received a copy of the letter from the inspector who had specifically requested that you all get a copy before the December meeting? When have you taken the, the ch well, chair to task for not the, circulating that letter? Before we answer that, can I just bring us back to the HMICS letter? Because what the HMICS letter says, and I've just confirmed it with HMICS sitting next to me, is that he says that I accept it will be properly a matter for the board to approve the corporate governance framework. That's fine. And my comments are intended to solely inform members ahead of their decision next week. Now, I 
think, on the basis of conversations that I had had with Derek, the conversations with both Moy and George, that I was fully aware, I went into that meeting fully aware of the views of HMICS. That's not the point, That's not the no, point Mr Hume. The point is, the Chief Inspector asked the Chair to circulate the meeting to every board member. It should have been circulated, and if I'd been a non-executive director and found out at a much later stage that that letter, I, I, you know, I didn't receive it and only got it by accident because the chairman got a roasting at this committee, as a non-executive director, you should have been on to the chair to demand that future letters like this, where there's clearly interest and a request Indeed, for it to be circulated absolutely. to the board, and if you're, if you're not prepared to do that, you're not fit to be a non-executive director. You're there to hold the chair, amongst others, we're, to account. We're quite aware of that. The letter well, you doesn't... You don't seem to be. The you're letter... making excuses for him. No. Why, why have you not complained to the chair that this letter was not circulated as requested by the inspector? I mean, one of the things announced in the letter was the new review and inspection by the inspector. Indeed. Now, you didn't actually know that formally. I did. No, not formally you didn't. Well, he that told was the first... me. No, he didn't tell you formally. It has to go to the board. You know, if, if, if that's the level of scrutiny you're exercising as a non-executive director, personally, I find it wholly inadequate. You're supposed to hold the chair to account. And if the chair has not circulated a letter specifically from the inspector who has specifically asked the board that the board see it, uh, whether or not you already knew the information, every member of the board maybe didn't know all the information. The point is, if the inspector wants it circulated, surely it should be circulated. Surely as a former inspector, Mr Graham, you would have expected that to happen. Um. Yes, yes, you've made a number of uh, assertions that I, I think there's a fair bit of relationship informality which definitely happens, but in hindsight, and I'm sure the Chair will have reflected since you described his meeting at the Board last week or a fortnight ago, will have reflected that. I, I certainly would have appreciated seeing the detail of that letter. So have you now made it clear to the Chairman, in future you don't expect a repeat of this? Um, I have not had that conversation. Was well, it not time you did? Well, it may well be, but... Um, well, are, you I, I, are you going to? Are you going to? I think the most, are you important, going to? the most important thing... You can keep asking me that question, well, but I'd like to, to give you a full answer well, yes to it, or no, Are you going to tell the chairman you don't want it to happen again? I have great respect for how the chair is managing business. I certainly do not want a whole host of issues coming up, but I certainly would have the discussion with him that says it would have been useful to see a letter which specifically said should have been to the board. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mr White? Which bit would you like me to answer? Well, are you, are you, have you complained to the chairman that the letter wasn't circulated as requested? No, I haven't complained to the, complained to the chairman. Why but not? Like, like others here, I was fully aware of mm -hmm. the views of HMICS. So, uh, it, it, Sorry. in a sense, it was, a, it, it was already factored into the decision-making that we had. Poor. If I may, I mean, although I had conversations with, uh, with all the members and they would be clear of my intention and my views, um, the letter which extends to, I think, to three pages went into some nuance and detail around exactly. um, that. And there was things in there I know that I wouldn't have discussed with members. So without wanting to be objectionable around that, there was stuff contained in the letter that was a level of detail that I would not have had the opportunity to explain in conversations in the margins with members. And another part for me was just if you like, to clarify um, our position and correct evidence. When, when I sent the letter to the SPA, which was on the 9th of December, it was also copied to the Chief Executive. Well, he said in this committee he hadn't seen it. And I'm, I'm offering to correct that evidence in terms of uh, our, our recollection, not a recollection of the email that so, we sent. So, having heard what the Chief Inspector has just said, are you, are you now prepared to go to the Chair and say this is totally unacceptable? Yeah, I mean, I think I've always been prepared to have that discussion, and uh, I, I think the chair himself will reflect on exactly the information which he uh, discussed with you a fortnight ago. But I, I've always been prepared to have that discussion. You're not leaving us with a lot of confidence that you're doing the proper job of a non-executive director. I have to say. Yeah, and I think can I can I just come back on that because I think it's wonderful that you can make such assertions. <laughs> There is an awful lot of really good things that we do I'm as a board. I, and the focus on one singular point 
a, a failure, if you want to call it that, a failure to circulate a letter, a deliberate uh, judgment on, on someone's behalf, to focus on that and then to describe the board as inadequate, I think is a poor characterisation of what we're doing. And I certainly feel quite passionate about policing. But I am in this for only one purpose, to I help the Police Service of Scotland deliver the very best it can for communities. So to come in here and to hear, because of one particular issue, you make an assertion that we are inadequate as a well, board, I think is unfair. Well, well, just a minute. You're getting paid as a non-executive director. You're getting paid by the public as a yeah. non-executive director. And I am quite simply, and disag and I am quite and simply disagreeing. And the job. I'm, and I'm quite Thank simply you. disagreeing with your assertion, and I am entitled to do that. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Graham. OK, we're not going to get very far collectively this morning if we shout at each other exactly. and if you talk over me again Mr Graham your microphone will be cut off equally I would say to members there are passions around the table but let's try and just lower the temperature but nevertheless we will still be seeking answers and we will be robust in our scrutiny and nothing will stop this committee from doing that Mr Neil can I just make the point that it's not a one-off this ever since this board was set up there have been real problems time after time after time. What the Chief Inspector has just said, I think, has to be taken very seriously by every member of the board. I absolutely appreciate your former service and that you're very committed to the future of the police service uh, and you've got a very good track record in serving the nation and the police. But in your new role as a non-executive director, Part of your function is to make sure that the board is operating efficiently, transparently, holding the chair and others to account, the chief constable and others. And the point I'm making is that this is clearly on the fundamental issue of governance and the governance review has not happened. And I think in that respect, and, and solely that respect I'm making comment, I think the non-executive members of the board have not fulfilled the function with the robustness that you need to fulfill your function. And I think you need to be able to say to the chair, don't do that again. I'm not asking for the chair's resignation or anyone's resignation or anything like that. Because we all have to learn lessons, and as you said yourself, Mr Graham, you're new to the role of a non-executive director. So what I'm saying is we are paying non-executive directors to hold people to account. On this occasion, clearly, especially in the light of the Chief Inspector's comments, that did not happen. Your job now is to make sure that there's no repeat and that it happens in future. That's the point I'm making. I'm not trying to uh, in any way deride your service or anyone else's service, but I, want, I, like you, want to see an efficient Scottish Police Authority holding people to account, and that includes internal account. Uh, clearly, you've heard this morning uh, about you know, people being denied information. Uh, you've heard loads of other stories as well. There's clearly still, as everybody agrees, a lot more to do to get the Scottish Police Authority into the position where it needs to be to gain the confidence of this Parliament and the Scottish people. Yeah, thank you, convener, and thank you, Mr Neil, for those comments. And I do respect your position on this particular issue, and I accept that. And as you clearly point out, and I accept myself, I am still very much learning in my endeavours. Um, but what, what I would say is there is a number of tangible examples where I think we have um, engaged in effective scrutiny. And so I wouldn't like the committee to have the impression that just because of this one single issue, it was that was completely how we behaved. Um, and I just finally, can I just say that a number of our staff within the SPA who have, I think, been through a fairly turbulent three or four years, work in incredibly hard to try and support us as non-executive uh, directors and do an awful lot of good work and sometimes some of the publicity which comes out, n not a fault of this committee because I respect your job to do the scrutiny, but some of the pub publications that come out um, definitely affect how they feel about their work and I would just like to put on record an appreciation for how they are supporting us, and, but I do expect that we are, that we are still learning. I think we would uh, endorse that appreciation. Can I, can I just say also, uh, as a non-executive director, and I fully understand that you know, there are some details and issues you couldn't get involved in between the chair and Mo Ali, but given the damage to the perception of the SP that was done by the way in which uh, Mo's departure from the board uh, was, I think, forced, actually, not just handled, but forced, I would have thought as a non-executive director, um, without 
necessarily get into taking sides or anything, but from the point of view of your remit as non-executive directors, I think there was a legitimate case for the non-executive directors at the board meeting to raise the issue of how that had been handled, because there is no doubt, irrespective of who was right and who was wrong, there is no doubt at all that it has done, over now a period of months, significant damage both to the perception and the reputation of the Scottish Police Authority. And again, if I may say so, and I say this, you know, trying to be positive, I think you need to be more robust in situations like this and raise with the chairman when that kind of thing happens and get it sorted before it does become a, a PR disaster, which this has been, for the Scottish Police Authority. Okay. Liam Kerr. Thank you. Uh, I just have a few matters arising from the, the questioning, really. Uh, just turning, since we're on the topic, to the letter of 9th of December, I asked Mr Penman, were you surprised when you learned that the letter hadn't gone to the rest of the board? Um, I, I didn't actually. I, I didn't chase up to see if it had been um, distributed. There was an assumption, I think, that it, that it would have been. Um, so yeah, it would be fair to say I, I was because my expectation would be um, this year. I would also caveat that by saying that it was advice. It wasn't a recommendation. I was putting my views there, and I was explicit in the letter that and recognised it was a matter for the board to approve. But I did have an expectation that at least that members would be aware of my views and some of the nuances in there to make an informed decision at the board meeting. Uh, and Mr Graham, you used to do Mr Penman's job, I think I'm right in saying. So when you found out that this letter had been tabled in the terms that it was, were you surprised that the letter hadn't been passed on to you? Um, yes, I would have expected that letter to have been circulated to us, yeah. Uh, did you raise that surprise, expectation with Mr Flanagan or anyone else? Uh, I haven't raised it directly, but it has been discussed. I mean, I think uh, Mr Flanagan gave evidence to this committee not so long ago, I think it was a fortnight ago, um, to the effect his judgment was that we knew what was the, the content of the letter. I, I think that was a reasonable judgment because, as other members have said, I was certainly well aware of, uh, of Mr Penman's views about holding meetings in private or in public. So I think that was the explanation. You may not find that acceptable, that's the explanation, and, uh, and, and that was, I, I've accepted that. I, I find it neither acceptable nor unacceptable. I'm just curious, if, if you say you were surprised or you expected to receive this and then didn't, uh, just going back to Mr Neil's point, I think if I was in your shoes, I'd have been expressing some strong views. And it, it sounds like you're saying to me that that conversation hasn't happened. No, that hasn't happened. I may be uh, wrong in this, you may have a different view in this, but I went into the discussions and debates, which was not just about the 15th of December. We'd been discussing governance for some time. I went into that discussion and debate and the decision on the 15th of December to approve the governance review, which included meetings of committees in private. I went to that with the belief that I had a full understanding of various stakeholders' views, including HMICS. Uh, and I'll put the same question to Mr White and Mr Hume. Would you, having now seen this letter, are you surprised that it wasn't provided to you? I accept you knew, or you say you knew the contents or the, the tone of it, but are you surprised with hindsight that that wasn't passed on to you? I we, think that, that for my own part, I think the letter should have been passed on. I don't think anybody would dispute that. Um, I didn't see this as a one-off intervention from HMICS um, in, in this debate. And I come back to my own decision to support the, the way going forward in December was entirely contingent upon the fact that we were going to review it. I had a reasonably clear idea in my mind at that stage of how I would want to review what we were doing. Um, and I th was looking forward to a, a fairly regular interaction with HMICS as that approach developed. And I would just say that in terms of the points that Mr Neil has raised, right from the earliest point when I inter well, 
became involved in this discussion around governance have taken the view that what we need to do is to extend our remit beyond committee meetings and papers to look at things like access to information and how we deal with stakeholders, service users and the public and, and draw a much wider spectrum. So, and, and that's still my hope and intention so that when we come back in the autumn with that review carried out, it will go beyond committee meetings and it will in extend into issues about how we deal with information, how we deal with correspondence and those issues that we talked about ten minutes ago about things like the release of information to Moy and so on. Okay, it, but it's got can to I, be that wider can spectrum. I come in? I, we have very little time to, to make a wider point. I, I, I say that with all due respect, of Thank course. It's, uh, but it, it, you must then have a concern. I address this to the remaining uh, board members. You must then have a concern that there may be other significant information that is being withheld. Or do you have that concern? If, if, if something like this can be withheld, and two out of three, and Mr White may have had the same view, uh, express surprise that it had been withheld, uh, do you have a concern that other documents, other significant information is being withheld? Perhaps a strong word in this regard. Um, I would have expected it to be circulated. That it was not, I think, reflects the fact that we had had a year and a bit discussion of governance issues and that the issues raised in the letter were part of those discussions. Uh, we were aware that HMICS had a view on, on various parts of it, and I think that was reflected in the discussion we had, uh, both at members' meetings and at the public meeting on the 15th of December. Um, so I, I suppose I would characterise it as uh, perhaps a, a, a one-off error of judgment, a mistake by the chair. He, he perhaps misread the situation that it should have been passed on. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't see it as any deliberate attempt to prevent the board members knowing of others' views, of stakeholders' views, because we had already uh, had a, a long discussion of stakeholders' views. Mm -hmm. Mr Perman. The point is, is, in terms of reference, we'll follow today, as I said, one of the things we will be looking at specifically is the process by which the authority came to the decision around holding meetings in private, and that would include um, legal advice around the legislation that exists. It would include the stakeholder uh, engagement feedback they received um, from that um, as well. So we would have a look to see what advice was taken and, and what, was, what members were, were cited on in making that decision, and we'll comment publicly on that. Ms Ali? My concern is that there seemed to be a very informal arrangement in sharing the HMICS concerns. It was quite legitimate for Derek to raise them with us individually. Um, that was perfectly appropriate. But there is a role for the chair and the chief executive in formally sharing those with the board. Ordinarily, I would have very little contact with Derek. In fact, only had contact with him because I happened to be sitting on a group that he was on and we had conversations on the fringes. That it, um, it, well, I won't speak for Derek, but he wrote a formal letter to inform board members, the whole of the board, including people who have not had the sort of contact that those around this table have, which would go for a number of board members. They would not ordinarily have that contact, just as I would not ordinarily have had that contact. And so for me, the purpose of a formal letter is to formally notify the board of a position and the failure to share that is a concern because, as I've already said, the, the representation of Derek's views to the board came not from the chair or the chief executive, but from those of us who happened to have a conversation on the fringes of meetings. That is not an acceptable position. The chair and the chief executive must take the lead in sharing formal advice with the board. And if we accept that, uh, again, going back to the point Mr Neil raised, uh, did you, during your term, and the current members during your term currently, feel that you are being given sufficient information to carry out your responsibilities? Or might there be a suggestion that in incidents like this, there is uh, information being withheld such that you are hindered in your ability to sufficiently hold the 
chair to account? Well, obviously, we, we can't say that there was, because if there was, we were not aware of it. Um, clearly, on, in this instance, there was. And I think my concern about this particular issue is that the chair's review of governance was the chair's review of governance. Um, and therefore, my concern is that the, the advice, the formal advice that came through from HMICS actually questioned just two areas of that, um, but they were the two areas that were actually significantly different to the way that we'd been doing things previously. So I think there was an incentive not to share that letter because obviously it questioned those two areas, in fact the two areas that I spoke out on. Um, so for me the concern was not before that point, because I don't think I had concerns before that point, because I assumed that anything that came to the board would be shared with us. But looking back now with the benefit of hindsight, I do wonder whether the, there was other information that came for the whole board that was not shared with us. I'm not saying that there was, I don't know, but obviously there is now a question mark in my mind that didn't exist previously. Mr White, how do you respond to that? Are you being given the tools to carry out your responsibilities? I believe in large part we are, and where we're not, it's often on day-to-day -day or business case decisions, and many of those are a matter where we're challenging Police Scotland to give us further information in order to allow us to make appropriate decisions. In terms of uh, this kind of information around governance or, or something that is uh, going out to a much wider stakeholder group, there is an element where you have to, as a non-executive, rely on the day-to-day -day work of your officers gathering information together and presenting it to you. And that does seem to happen. We do seem to have views collated in from, from other bodies, certainly uh, working groups I've been involved in or, or uh, work around that. So, for instance, the, the, the scrutiny inquiry we did into the police carriage of firearms, we, we had a lot of information gathered in from wider stakeholders, and that was presented to us in a way that we could then collate and uh, bring together and understand in order to go forward to decisions making. Uh, so I'm not aware of anything being held back from us. Uh, if it were regularly happening, then I would imagine that there would be others outside who would be complaining about that because they would feel we hadn't made decisions uh, in knowledge of, of the information they were providing. And I haven't seen any evidence that that's the case. Mr Graham, you want to come in, um, but can you keep it very brief if possible, please? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Not known for brevity, but I'll do my best. Um, um, I'm not referring to the specific issue around HMIC's letter. This is a much more general point. Um, two years ago when I first started on the board, it was very challenging to uh, actually absorb some of the data that had been provided. Police Scotland provided reports which were almost volumes because largely we asked for it. We wanted more information and more information, and we were drowning, for want of a better word, in data. And actually, there is a real skill in figuring out what is the real issue here. We'll try and get to the judgment now. An awful lot of our staff, and indeed I would guess the chair and other members involved in this, make those judgments on a daily basis. We won't always get that right, but I think overload is sometimes a big problem. I certainly don't have concerns at the moment, although I uh, accept the perception, but I don't have concerns at the moment that anything is withheld. If I've asked for anything, I normally get it, and usually much more than I need. Mr Hume, do you have anything to add to that? Well, just in, in terms of um, how we take this forward, um, Brian Barber alluded to a, a belief that I had that have that, that decisions should be taken in public unless there are explicit reasons why they should be taken in private. My experience of, of um, the kind of issue that we're dealing with here um, suggests to me that in looking at this, we need to be looking at the um, how the, the organisation is structured the, and the culture within the organisation. And that's an issue that in uh, the coming months, as I take forward that broader review of openness and transparency, um, I'm convinced that you will see in the autumn when we report on that, as will HMICS, a very strong statement about how information is handled and how it's made available. Quick final question. Uh, you mentioned Mr Barber there. If I might come to you briefly, Mr Barber. Uh, 
were asked earlier about the, uh, some of the statements you've made about the Scottish Government interference, if I can put it that way, and there seemed to be a bit of a disconnect between your assertions and the current board members. Uh, did you raise any of those assertions in your resignation letter at the time? In, not in my resignation letter. I raised the assertions in the email to the chair, which was a welcome, a, a sort of hello and goodbye, to say I'm conscious that we haven't met. Here are my thoughts. I'd be happy to discuss them in the meeting. What I then expected to happen was that, chair, well, as we did, we met, and the chair would listen to my views and then go and have some dialogue with the introductory meetings to other board members and make a decision where my view is representative of a wider held view, or was it just that was my view and there was nobody else would substantiate it? I, I don't know what happened after that. It just, I'll ask you a very blunt question. Uh, why have you waited 18 months to kind of blow the lid on this? Uh, I think the, the the answer to that is the I have been silent. Uh, in my introductory um, mention, I said I've been silent for 18 months. It was only after the treatment of Moy where I thought um, the whole issue had bubbled up and I thought it appropriate to say I did have concerns. And also the chair had made a comment in the last meeting about uh, the meeting I had with him. So I, I wrote to the committee to correct what might have been uh, a misleading impression of that meeting. Mr. Penn. It's just in relation to, to Brian's email, and if I could offer some um, reassurance to the committee around the appointment of Chief Constable, I was involved in giving advice around the selection process to that, and I certainly have no concerns around the integrity by which that was done in terms of the selection process that was run or the criteria. Um, and probably just again, just for the benefit of the record and reassurance um, of members, the, the, the selection panel, which included um, some members here, also included uh, an independent chief executive from a local authority who were there. So it's just, I think, just for the record, I think helpful to say that. There were, there were no issues, and even the selection criteria to me was a standard selection criteria that would have been used for chief officers. The only potential exception being about not previously having been a chief constable is one. But when you move to a single service in Scotland, where there only is one chief constable, you have to then look, I think, flexibly to allow other people within the organisation to come through. So I think just I felt that's useful to put that on the record, just to uh, assure members. Thank you. Um, can I very quickly just wrap up with a couple of issues? Um, I've got the letter in front of me and I, I hear what everybody says about their awareness of the issues being raised by Mr Penman. Um, can I ask, were any of the non-executive directors aware of the fact that he was going to conduct an inspection before he sent the letter on the 9th of December? Yes, I, I was because he told me. That was anybody else in the board aware of it? Was it discussed? Prior to this, it was discussed at the board. I think both George and Moy made uh, contributions at uh, meetings, uh, talking about uh, discussions they had had with HMICS. Prior um, to the letter of the 9th of December. So, can I just clarify? My yep. own, in my own words, what I said, and I think it's minuted too, that I said that my understanding was HMICS had not formed a view yet. Okay. about inspection okay. and that's minuted I, I so I did not know okay can I can I ask I mean you know genuinely if the letter contained information about the inspection forthcoming inspection as it did would you have expected that to be circulated to the board okay to have been told okay. I'm aware I can't remember the date but I'm aware of the chief executive informing us at okay. a members meeting that HMICS intended to carry out an inspection. OK. After it appeared in the press, in fact. I mean, that's the time. It well, appeared in the press and we were informed afterwards. Thank you. I think, I think the relevance is an, a letter of such import should have been circulated to the board, and you, you accepted that, which is, is helpful. Um, again, let me ask you something, because I'm slightly confused. You've got board meetings, committee meetings, members' meetings. I also see reference to committee chairs' meetings. Have I missed any meetings out? Pre-meetings. Do they have pre-meetings too? Oh, Goodness. Good. There are board pre-meetings which are okay. private. There are private board meetings which are private. There are public board meetings which are public. There are private committee meetings which are private. There are members' meetings which are private. In fact, the only, it, it's easier to say the only public meetings are public board meetings. Okay. All of the other meetings are private. So, so in percentage terms, would that be as much as 25% in public, or am I being over generous? What, 25% of, of what? Of all meetings. 
you seem, you seem, you seem to meet on that. a very regular basis in different committees, mm -hmm. and with the exception of the board on occasion, the rest are all in private. Would that be a fair reflection? Uh, yeah, Mr Graham. Uh, uh, yes, convener. We, as non-executive members, we are contracted to do no more than five days a month. Um, there are eight public board meetings which are... I would, I would say that uh, we consider them very important and almost a duty parade, uh, to use the language that I used to use. Uh, and so the eight public board meetings are must attend. The rest of the meetings, um, I will attend one or two a month, uh, I think, uh, and they're all private. Yeah. OK. Because um, based on the information we were given, there are at least 14 private members' meetings at which governance was discussed. Do you think that makes any kind of sense, given the topic under discussion? It's the structure of 14 uh, different meetings. I think um, there have been meetings, obviously, to discuss the terms of that governance review and moving it forward to the board. But I think the significant thing is that the decisions are all taking, taken in uh, public, unless there's a reason that they have to be taken um, in, in private session. I think the problem is most people would like to know how thinking evolves, and for none of those I, meetings that, to have well, anything I, minuted or published I, I is, think that's, is unhelpful. I that's a very good point, and one of the um, issues that I'll be, or one of the, the source documents that I'll be looking at as I take forward my own deliberations about how we uh, run our meetings is actually uh, going back to the Local Government Access to Information Act, mm -hmm. which I think provides a very good structure for how meetings should be run and significantly, on your point, places a requirement on local authorities, in, in that case, to publish and reports all the background information that led to that yeah. decision. So I think in terms of this review pe period going forward, again, um, I would expect that unless uh, there's good reason not to, I'll be reflecting on the benefits that can be imported into our structure, because there is no local authorities are unique in the sense that there is a piece of legislation that stipulates how meetings should be conducted, when papers should be circulated, the information that should be presented. There's no standard uh, note that I'm aware of or, or piece of legislation pertaining to public boards. What I think I'll be looking at is whether we can take the structure of the Access to Information Act and apply it to how we run our business here. So there's absolute clarity, not just at the point of the decision making, but the trail that leads up to So that you, you would be looking perhaps to publish or at least review um, the fact that papers are sent to stakeholders in advance before they're published on the website. Yes, ab absolutely. Everything would be absolutely. included. That's yes, helpful yes. to know. OK, one final, just tidying up. Um, we understood that in 2014, HMICS um, published a terms of reference for its first review of the Scottish Police Authority. Look, though we might, we can't find the final report. Um, was one produced? And I don't know whether to put this to Mr Graham or Mr Penman. I'm not sure where that comes from, because the, the, the review we're doing currently is, is the first review and our terms of reference will be published today um, from that, so I'm just in, interested in where that may be a, a misprint or it may be referring to something else that we've done. It might relate to the forensic science um, inspection that we have. We'll, we'll go check back. Uh, we understood there were terms of reference published, but we will check that information. OK. Um, can I thank all the witnesses? It's been a very robust morning. Um, but can I thank you for your attendance and for providing information to the committee? Um, I should advise the committee and the public gallery um, that I will not be taking item three on the agenda, which was the section 22 reports on colleges. We will defer consideration of those till next week's meeting purely because we run out of time and the committee requires some time in private session to consider what we've heard today. So thank you very much for attending. We'll now move into private session and I'll have a two-minute break.